be lethal. lethal. For one, according to Rogoff and Reinhardt, they see uh, the, a drop in housing prices of one-third, which means people's homes are worth less than their mortgages, meaning they can't possibly ever pay off their mortgage and they must default with enormous losses that cascade across the economy. Because they have no net equity, they can't find a place to live. Unemployment rises by seven percentage points in the average financial crisis, Mr. Speaker. And according to the University of Calgary, in Canada, for every one percentage point increase in the unemployment rate, you get a two percentage point increase in the suicide rate. In financial crises that happened uh, across Asia, for example, in 1997, there were 10,000 excess suicides that occurred. In the great global recession, the great recession of the 2008-9 period, there were also another 10,000 additional economic suicides reported by the British Journal of Psychiatry. There is an abundance of scholarly evidence that financial crises destroy not only people's livelihoods and their bank accounts and their net worth, but also force many to do the most desperate of deeds. And that is exactly what we need to avoid. But history also gives us reason for hope. And let me look back at another part of our history. As I said at the outset, only once in history has the deficit in Canada been bigger than it was last year, and that was in the middle of the Second World War. Our men and women returned from the battlefield having this enormous debt. And you know what they did? They immediately worked to pay it off. By 1947, the federal government was running the single biggest budget surplus as a share of GDP in Canadian history, 5% of GDP. That would be the equivalent of a surplus of over $100 billion today were it matched relative to our economy now. And from the end of the war to 1973, our economy grew from $12 billion to $128 billion. That is economic growth of 1,000%, literally 1,000% increase in the size of our nominal economy. So our ancestors returned from the battlefields and went to the farm fields and factories and unleashed a torrent of production at the same time as they exercised good, responsible management. They had fought for our freedom and then they returned to fight for our finances. And they basically vaporized the debt. Now it is, in tr it is true that in this period there was a phenomenal growth in the industrial power of our economic system. New machinery was invented that allowed our factories, our mines, our warehouses, and our transportation systems to crank out far more goods and services for our people than ever before. But happily, the same is now ha occurring with technology. We are experiencing another industrial technological revolution that can empower the same kind of productive enhancements. But it will take change and it will take an effort to secure our future. We need to unleash the free enterprise system, restore industry and frugality at the same time so that our incomes can outpace our debts, so that we can replace a credit card economy with a paycheck economy, so that our people can be confident in their ability to, to pay down their mortgages and our governments to pay down their debts so that our, our, our programs upon which our most vulnerable rely will always have a solid financial footing, so that our hardworking public servants can continue to draw the salaries that they deserve. This is what it means to secure our future. Unfortunately, we have a government that is focused exclusively on the myopia of the here and now, taking incredible risks as we sit on the edge of this debt cliff. But Mr. Speaker, it does not have to be this way because just as our history tells us of the folly of the past, 
It tells us about the hope for the future. And we in this party will build upon that hope and stand on the shoulders of our ancestors who gave us this mighty and great country and let us keep Canada strong and free. Thank you. I want to thank the Honourable Member. Uh, this is the end of the time as we're moving into the budget, uh, which should start uh, momentarily. Uh, but when we do return, the Honourable Member will have 10 minutes of questions and com uh, comments coming to him uh, when we uh, resume debate.
Tom, il est 16h05. Il est... As it is 4.05, it is my duty to interrupt the deliberations on the motion. Consequently, the debate will be held at a next session. Consideration of ways and means proceedings number two concerning the budget presentation. Ms. Freeland, seconded by Madame Fortier, moves that this House approve in general the budgetary policy of the government. L'Honorable Ministre des Finances. The Honorable Minister of Finance. Mr. Speaker, pursuant to Standing Order 83-1, I would like to table, in both official languages, the budget documents for 2021, including the notices of ways and means motions. Les détails concernant les mesures sont exposés. The details regarding these measures are included in these documents and pursuant to Standing Order 83-2. I ask that the study of these motions be added to the orders of the day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Mr. Speaker, I would like to begin by taking a moment to mourn the tragedy in Nova Scotia a year ago yesterday. To the families and friends of the 22 people who were killed, and to all Nova Scotians, we grieve with you. This is also a day when people across Canada are fighting the most virulent wave of the virus we've experienced so far. Healthcare workers in many provinces are struggling to keep ICUs from overflowing, and millions of Canadians are facing stringent new restrictions. We're all tired, frustrated, and even afraid. But we will get through this. We'll do it together. la lutte. This budget is about finishing the fight against COVID. It's about healing the economic wounds left by the COVID recession. And it's about creating more jobs, as well as prosperity for Canadians in the days and in the decades to come. L'objectif est de répondre aux besoins. The goal is to meet the urgent needs of today and to build for the long term. This is a budget focused on middle class Canadians. It's focused on pulling more Canadians up into the middle class. This is a plan that embraces this moment of global transformation to a green, and clean economy. This budget addresses three fundamental challenges. First, we need to conquer COVID. That means buying vaccines and supporting provincial and territorial health care systems. It means enforcing our quarantine rules at the border and within the country. It means providing Canadians and Canadian businesses with the support they need to get through these tough third wave lockdowns and to come roaring back when the economy fully reopens. Second, we must punch our way out of the COVID recession. That means ensuring lost jobs are recovered as swiftly as possible and hard hit businesses rebound quickly. It means providing support where COVID has struck the hardest to women, to young people, to low wage workers, and to small and medium-sized businesses, especially in tourism and hospitality. The final challenge is to build a more resilient Canada. Better, more fair, more prosperous, and more innovative. That means investing in Canada's green transition and the green jobs that go with it. 
in Canada's digital transformation and Canadian innovation, and in building infrastructure for a dynamic, growing country. And it means providing Canadians with social infrastructure, from early learning and childcare, to student grants, to income top-ups, so the middle class can flourish and more Canadians can join it. Nos aînés ont été les principales. Our elders have been this virus's principal victims. The pandemic has preyed on them mercilessly, ending thousands of lives and forcing all seniors into fearful isolation. We have failed so many of those living in long-term care facilities. To them, and to their families. Let me say this. I am so sorry. We owe you so much better than this. That's why we propose a $3 billion investment to help ensure that provinces and territories provide a high standard of care in their long-term care facilities. And we are delivering today on our promise to increase old age security for Canadian men and women aged 75 and older. Our government has been urgently procuring vaccines since last spring and providing them at no cost to Canadians. Nearly 10 million Canadians have received at least one dose of vaccine. By the end of September, Canada will have received 100 million doses, enough to fully vaccinate every adult Canadian. We need to be ready for new variants of COVID, and we must have the booster shots that will allow us to keep them in check. That's why we're rebuilding our national biomanufacturing capacity, so that we can make these vaccines here in Canada. Canada has brilliant scientists and entrepreneurs. We'll support them with an investment of $2.2 billion in biomanufacturing and life sciences. Lorsque la COVID a frappé pour la première fois, when COVID first hit, it pushed our country into its deepest recession since the Great Depression. Toutefois, il s'agit d'une choc. This, however, is an economic shock of a very particular kind. We are not suffering because of endogenous flaws or imbalances within our economy. Rather, the COVID recession is driven by an entirely external event, like the economic devastation of a flood, a blizzard, a wildfire, or other natural disaster. That is why an essential part of Canada's fight against COVID has been unprecedented. The unprecedented level of federal support for Canadians and Canadian businesses has been offered. We knew that Canadians needed a lifeline to get through this COVID storm. And our approach has worked. Canada's GDP grew by almost 10% in the fourth quarter of last year. We will continue to do whatever it takes. Our government is prepared to extend support measures as long as the fight against this virus requires them. As Canada pivots to recovery, our economic plan will do the same. We promised last year to spend up to $100 billion over three years to get Canada back to work and to ensure the lives and prospects of Canadians are not permanently stunted by this pandemic recession. This budget keeps that promise. Altogether, we will create nearly 500,000 new training and work experience opportunities for Canadians. 
we will fulfill our throne speech commitment to create one million jobs by the end of this year. Some will say our sense of urgency is misplaced. Some will say that we're spending too much. To them, I ask this. Did you, you, did you lose your job during a COVID lockdown? Were you reluctantly let go by your small business employers who were like a family to you, but simply could not afford your salary any longer? Are you worried you'll be laid off in this third wave? Are you a mother forced to quit the dream job you fought to get because there was no way to keep working while caring for your young children? Did you graduate last spring and are you still struggling to find work? Is your family business launched perhaps by your parents and which you'd hope to pass on to your children now struggling under a sudden burden of debt and fending off bankruptcy through sheer grit and determination every day? If COVID has taught us anything, it's that we're all in this together. Our country cannot prosper if we leave hundreds of thousands of Canadians behind. The world has learned the lesson of 2009, the cost of allowing economic hardship to fester. In some countries, democracy itself has been threatened by that mistake. We will not let that happen in Canada. Environ 300,000 Canadians about 300,000 Canadians who had a job before the pandemic are still out of work. And more Canadians may lose their jobs in this month's lockdowns. To support Canadian workers as we fight the third wave and to provide an economic bridge to a fully recovered economy, we will build on the enhancements we have made during the pandemic. We will maintain flexible access to employment insurance benefits for another year until the fall of 2022. The Canada Recovery Benefit, which we created to support Canadians not covered by employment insurance, will remain in place through September 25th and extend an additional 12 weeks of benefits to Canadians. As our economy fully reopens over the summer, the benefit amount will go to $300 a week after July 17th. Low-wage workers in Canada work harder than anyone else in this country for less pay. In the past year, they have faced both significant infection risks as well as layoffs. And many people live below the poverty line, even though they work full-time. We cannot ignore their contribution and their hardship, and we will not. We propose to expand the Canada Workers' Benefit to invest $8.9 billion over six years in additional support for low-wage workers. This will extend income top-ups to about a million more Canadians and lift nearly 100,000 people out of poverty. And this budget will introduce a $15 an hour federal minimum wage. COVID has exposed the dangerous inadequacy of sickness benefits in Canada, 
we will do our part and fulfill our, com our campaign commitment by extending EI sickness benefits from 15 to 26 weeks. We know the pandemic has exacerbated systemic barriers faced by racialized Canadians. So, Budget 2021 provides additional funding for the Black Entrepreneurship Program, as well as an investment in a Black-led philanthropic endowment fund to help fight anti-Black racism and improve social and economic outcomes in Black communities. One of the most striking aspects of the pandemic has been the historic sacrifice young Canadians have made to protect their parents and grandparents. Our youth have paid a high price to keep the rest of us safe. We cannot and we will not allow young Canadians to become a lost generation. They need our support to launch their adult lives and careers in post-COVID Canada, and they will get it. We will invest $5.7 billion over five years in Canada's youth. We will make college and university more accessible and affordable. We will create job openings in skilled trades and high-tech industries, and we will double the Canada Student Grant for two more years while extending the waiver of interest on federal student loans through March 2030. More than 350,000 low-income student borrowers will also have access to more generous repayment assistance. COVID has brutally exposed something women have long known. Without childcare, parents, usually mothers, can't work. The closing of our schools and daycares drove women's participation in the labor force down to its lowest level in more than two decades. Early learning and childcare has long been a feminist issue. COVID has shown us that it's an urgent economic issue too. I was two years old when the Royal Commission on the Status of Women urged Canada to establish a universal system of early learning and childcare. My mother was one of Canada's redoubtable second wave of feminists who fought and outside Quebec failed to make that recommendation a reality. A generation after that, Paul Martin and Ken Dryden tried again. This half century of struggle is a testament to the difficulty and complexity of the task. But this time, we're going to do it. This budget is the map and the trailhead. There is agreement across the political spectrum that early learning and childcare is the national economic policy we need now. This is social infrastructure that will drive jobs and growth. This is feminist economic policy. This is smart economic policy. That's why this budget commits up to $30 billion over five years, reaching $9.2 billion every year permanently to build a high quality affordable and accessible early learning and childcare system across Canada. This is not an effort that will deliver instant gratification. We are building something that, of necessity, must be constructed collaboratively and for the long term. But I have confidence in us. I have confidence that we are a country that believes in investing in our future, in our children, and in our young parents. Here is our goal. Five years from now, parents across the country should have access to high quality early learning and childcare for an average of $10 a day. I make this promise to Canadians today, speaking as your finance minister 
and as a working mother. We will get it done. In making this historic commitment, I want to thank the visionary leaders of Quebec, particularly Quebec's feminists, who have shown the rest of Canada the way forward. This plan will, of course, also provide additional resources to Quebec, which might well use them to further support an early learning and childcare system that is already the envy of the rest of Canada and indeed much of the world. Small businesses are the vital heart of our economy and they have been hardest hit by the lockdowns. Healing the wounds of COVID requires a rescue plan for them. So, Budget 2021 proposes to extend the wage subsidy, rent subsidy, and lockdown support for businesses and other employers until September 25, 2021, for an estimated total of $12.1 billion in additional support. To help the hardest hit businesses pivot back to growth, we propose a new Canada Recovery Hiring Program which will run from June to November and will provide $595 million to make it easier for businesses to hire back laid off workers or to bring on new ones. But our government will do much more than execute a rescue. With this budget, we will make unprecedented investments in Canada's small businesses, helping them invest in new technologies and innovation. We will invest up to $4 billion to help up to 160,000 small and medium-sized businesses buy and adopt the new technologies they need to grow. The Canada Digital Adoption Program will also provide businesses with the advice and help they need to get the most out of these new technologies by training 28,000 young Canadians, a Canadian technology core, and sending them out to work with our small and medium-sized businesses. This groundbreaking program will help Canadian small businesses go digital and become more competitive and efficient. Le financement accru Increased funding for the Venture Capital Catalyst Initiative will help provide financing to innovative Canadian businesses so they can grow. We will also encourage businesses to invest in themselves. We will allow immediate expensing of up to of, up, of up to one point five million dollars of eligible investments by Canadian controlled private corporations in each of the next three years. These larger deductions will support 325,000 businesses in making critical investments and will represent $2.2 billion in total savings to them over the next five years. Building for the future means investing in innovation and entrepreneurs. So, we propose to invest in the next phase of the Pan-Canadian Artificial Intelligence Strategy and to launch similar strategies in genomics and quantum science, areas where Canada is a global leader. In 2020, Job growth means green growth. This budget sets out a plan to help achieve GHG emissions reductions of 36% from 2005 levels by 2030 and puts us on a path to achieve net zero emissions by 2050. 
It puts in place the funding to achieve our 25% land and marine conservation targets by 2025. By making targeted investments in transformational technologies, we can ensure that Canada benefits from the next wave of global investment and growth. The resource and manufacturing sectors that are Canada's traditional economic pillars, energy, mining, agriculture, forestry, steel, aluminum, autos, aerospace, will be the foundation of our new, resilient, and sustainable economy. Canada will become more productive and competitive by supplying the green exports the world wants and needs. That is why we propose a historic investment of a further $5 billion over seven years, starting in 2021, 2022 in the Net Zero Accelerator. With this added support, on top of the $3 billion we committed in December, the Net Zero Accelerator will help even more companies invest to reduce their greenhouse gas emissions while continuing to grow their businesses. We will propel the green transition through new tax measures, including for zero emissions technology, carbon capture and storage, and green hydrogen. We are at a pivotal moment in the green transformation. We can lead or we can be left behind. Our government knows that the only choice for Canada is to be in the vanguard. Our growing population is one of our great economic strengths. And a growing country needs to build. We need to build housing. We need to build public transit. We need to build broadband. We need to build infrastructure. And we will. We will invest $2.5 billion and reallocate $1.3 billion in existing funding to help build, repair, and support 35,000 housing units. And we will support the conversion to housing of the empty office space that has appeared in our downtowns by reallocating $300 million from the Rental Construction Financing Initiative. Houses should not be passive investment vehicles for offshore money. They should be homes for Canadian families. So on January 1st, 2022, our government will introduce Canada's first national tax on vacant property owned by non-resident non-Canadians. Une croissance forte et Strong, sustained growth also depends on modern transit. That's why in February we announced $14.9 billion over eight years to build new public transit, electrify existing transit systems, and help to connect rural, remote, and Indigenous communities. Therefore, we are committing an additional $1 billion over six years for the Universal Broadband Fund to accelerate access to high-speed internet in rural and remote communities. We intend to draw even more talented, highly skilled people to Canada, including international students. Investments in this budget will support an immigration system that is easier to navigate, more efficient, and more efficient in welcoming the dynamic new Canadians who add to Canada's strength. Our 
government has made progress in righting the historic wrongs in Canada's relationship with Indigenous peoples. But we still have a lot of work ahead. It's important to note that Indigenous peoples have led the way in battling COVID. Their success is a credit to Indigenous leadership and self-governance. We will invest more than $18 billion to further narrow gaps between Indigenous and non-Indigenous peoples to support healthy, safe, and prosperous Indigenous communities and to an advance reconciliation with First, Inu First Nations, Inuit, and the Métis Nation. We will invest more than $6 billion for infrastructure in Indigenous communities and $2.2 billion to help end the national tragedy of missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls. This has been a year when we have learned that each of us truly is our brothers and our sisters keeper. Solidarity is getting us through this pandemic and solidarity depends on each of us bearing our fair share of the collective burden. That's why, now more than ever, fairness in our tax system is essential. To ensure our system is fair, this budget will invest in the fight against tax evasion, shine a light on beneficial ownership arrangements, and ensure that multinational corporations pay their fair share of tax in Canada. Our government is committed to working with our partners at the OECD to find multilateral solutions to the dangerous race to the bottom in corporate taxation. That includes work to conclude a deal on taxing large digital services companies. We are optimistic that such a deal can be reached this summer. Meanwhile, this budget reaffirms our government's commitment to impose such a tax, tax unilaterally until an acceptable multilateral approach comes into effect. It's also fair to ask those who have prospered in this bleak year to do a little more to help those who still need help. That is why we are introducing a luxury tax on new cars and private aircraft worth more than $100,000 and on pleasure boats worth more than $250,000. This budget lives up to our promise to do whatever it takes to support Canadians in the fight against COVID. And it makes significant investments in our future. All of this costs a lot of money. So it's entirely appropriate to ask, can we afford it? We can, and here's why. First, because this is a budget that invests in growth. The best way to pay our debts is to grow our economy. The investments this budget makes in early learning and ends. In fact, in today's low interest rate environment, not only can we afford these investments, it works over three years to support Canada's economic recovery. And that's what we are outlining here today. We predicted a deficit for 2020-2021 of $381.6 billion. We've spent less than we provisioned for. Our deficit for 2020-2021 is $354.2 billion, below our forecast. Finally, 
And crucially, we can afford this ambitious budget because the investments we propose today are responsible, but there are limits to our capacity to borrow, and that the world will not write Canada any blank checks. We don't expect any. This budget shows a declining debt-to-GDP ratio and a declining deficit, with the debt-to-GDP ratio falling to 49.2% by 2025-2026, and the deficit falling to 1.1% of GDP. These are important markers. They show that the extraordinary spending we have undertaken to support Canadians through this crisis and to stimulate a rapid recovery in jobs is... In 2015, Mr. Speaker, this federal government... And we did. Today, we meet a new challenge. Questions and comments. Questions et commentaires. The Honourable Member for Abbotsford. <laughs> Good try, guys. Good try. Well, Mr. Speaker, uh, let me be the first to formally congratulate my colleague on becoming the first female finance minister to table a federal budget in this House. Let me add that it's a remarkable accomplishment. It's long overdue, and I believe it defines a new role model for Canadian women across our country to aspire to. So again, congratulations, Minister. Now, I note that the Prime Minister's mandate letter to the Minister dated January 15th calls for her to present a new fiscal anchor to guide her work. The budget fails to do that. Instead, the budget contains vague references to declining debt-to-GDP ratio starting two years from now. Turns out that was the Liberal government's old fiscal anchor, so there was nothing new about this one. In fact, your anchor doesn't even include measurable targets that will give Canadians the comfort to know that their government understands the importance of proper debt management. All that we get are references to the trajectory of the debt-to-GDP anchor. So my question is this. Why did the minister not deliver a new fiscal anchor the way the Prime Minister had directed her to do? The Honourable Deputy Prime Minister and Minister of Finance. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And let me just start by thanking the member opposite for uh, those generous congratulations. And I think it would be appropriate for me today uh, to think about Kim Campbell, the first woman Prime Minister of Canada who was, of course, a Conservative woman Prime Minister. So I think one thing we should agree on in this House is that all of us believe it's important to advance the cause of women in Canada. Um, when it comes to a fiscal anchor, Mr. Speaker, uh, I very much agree with the member opposite that it is important for our spending to be reasonable and sustainable and prudent. And that why it was, that's why it was important for us in this budget to hit some key fiscal markers. First of all, we were clear in the fall economic statement that we would spend up to $100 billion in stimulus over three years. We have kept that promise. Perhaps more crucially, we have been clear in this budget, both in our commitment and also in our demonstrated actions, that following the extraordinary spending of this year, Canada's debt to GDP ratio will decline. And we show in our fiscal tables a clear declining trajectory ending in 25-26 at a 49.2% debt to GDP ratio. Further, as we point out in the budget document, we commit to unwinding the COVID-related deficits and our budget and our fiscal projections show precisely that. In 25-26, 
we come to a deficit of just 1.1%. So those, I would say to the honorable members and my colleague opposite, those are our anchors. A declining debt to GDP ratio and unwinding the COVID-related deficits. Comments, questions and commentaires, l'honorable député de Joliette. The honorable member for Joliette. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. It is now my turn to sincerely congratulate the Minister of Finance on her first budget. This is certainly a historic moment, both for her and for the economy. There are some measures in here that are entirely unprecedented. So I would like to congratulate the Deputy Prime Minister and Minister of Finance. Very sincerely congratulate her on her hard work. There are a great many measures in this. Many of them are promising, and we will certainly come back to them and analyze them later. I would also like to underscore that this is the first time that I see a concrete promise made regarding fighting tax avoidance and evasion. Of course, here it still hasn't been fully implemented, but at least it's a concrete set of intentions. I'd like to congratulate the minister on this. Now, in my opinion, there are two major gaps in this budget. First of all, health funding. Quebec and the provinces have asked for more health funding. We are in the middle of a health crisis. For the Bloc Québécois, this is the moment to fix this. If not now, then when? And then secondly, the main victims of this pandemic have been seniors. We have been asking for old age security to be increased as of 65 years of age, instead of creating a two-tier system for seniors. But that's not in the budget. Why didn't the Minister of Finance include those two measures in the budget? Especially since when we look at the difference in the deficit between the fall economic statement and the deficit here in the budget, well, the difference would correspond to those two measures. So is this a political choice? Thank you. I would just like to remind members that I have a long list of members who wish to speak. So I would ask everyone to keep their questions and answers very short. The Honorable Deputy Prime Minister and Minister of Finance. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to thank my colleague for the question. And I'd like to thank my colleague for all the fascinating discussions that we've had throughout the preparation process of this budget. I have greatly appreciated working with him. Now, first of all, I am very pleased that my honorable colleague has seen that we are taking action against tax evasion. That is a priority for our government especially now during a pandemic. Social solidarity is crucial. And in order to reach a state of social solidarity, everyone needs to pay their fair share. We need to focus on that. And I'm looking forward to working with all my colleagues on this important point. Now, my colleague is from Quebec. And so I would like to take a moment to state for all members in this House that this budget and the commitments in it clearly show the importance of Quebec's political leadership. More than 20 years ago, Quebec decided to create a child care system. It was difficult. It was very, very expensive. In fact, that, that's what I was told by Quebec architects of the system, that it was very expensive, I know. But Quebec showed us something very important, that having a child care system ultimately leads to excellent economic returns. Thus, it is very important for me as an Anglophone from Toronto to say thank you to Quebec. I don't see any women from Quebec here in the room right now, but I would really like to thank the feminists of Quebec who have worked so hard to build that program. Thank you. Now, regarding the two other points that my colleague raised, first of all, on health funding. Last month, we announced that we will be contributing five billion additional dollars for health for the provinces in order to help them fight the third wave of COVID-19. 
We understand that this is expensive, and the federal government is here to help. As for seniors, we have broadened old age security for those over 75. And we have also earmarked $3 billion for long-term care. This is a significant contribution. Regarding the fact that the deficit is lower than what was projected, well, I hope everyone will agree with me that that's a good thing. And it shows that our government is taking a cautious approach. Thank you. Had questions and comments. The Honourable Member for New Westminster Burnaby. A one-minute question and hopefully a one-minute answer. I know this is very difficult, but uh, please. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd also like to congratulate the Minister of Finance on this historic moment. Congratulations. Long wait for budget, uh, Mr. Speaker, as you know, as Canadians have been hit hard by this pandemic. And frontline workers who are looking for measures, looking for a functioning paid sick leave program, are going to come away profoundly disappointed by this budget. But billionaires will be happy because they continue to get a free ride at a time of overwhelming inequality and unprecedented increases in wealth for Canada's billionaires. This Liberal government has refused to put into place a wealth tax or end pandemic profiteering on the backs of Canadians. Tout ce qui offre, c'est un vague promesse de délire avec les vents. All it offers is a vague promise to deal with the $25 billion we use, we lose each year to tax evasion. Government, why does the finance minister, why does the, the prime minister refuse to put into place measures so that the ultra wealthy in this country pay their fair share? The Honourable Deputy Prime Minister and Finance Minister in 60 seconds or less, please. I'm going to be super quick. We're talking a lot about women, and since this is a question from the NDP, and since I did mention my mother in my speech, I just want to point out to the member opposite, she ran for the NDP in Edmonton Strathcona, now an NDP seat. So we have more in common than you might think. Um, on Canadian workers, let me just say, our expansion of the Canada workers' benefit is historic. No one should work full-time in Canada and live in poverty, but millions of people do. This investment will lift 100,000 Canadians out of poverty and will expand by one million people, the Canadians we support. I think that is great for Canadian workers. I think, I have to say, I think that's something my mother, were she still alive, would support too. I'm afraid that's all the time we have for now. The Honourable... <laughs> the Honourable Member for Abbotsford. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. These are unprecedented times. And today we have the biggest spending budget in Canadian history. But this budget comes far too late. It is this federal government's first budget in well over two years. For that long, Canadians have been without a comprehensive plan for the economy to guide us through what, we have not, what has now become the stormiest time of our lifetime. I believe that Canadians will feel let down by this budget. They were expecting a comprehensive plan to safely reopen our economy, to get Canadians vaccinated and back to work again, to help struggling small businesses back up on their feet, to manage the massive looming financial consequences of this pandemic, including a clear fiscal anchor that I mentioned earlier. And of course, most importantly, to provide future generations of Canadians with the hope and confidence that the Canadian dream is still alive and well. And my fear is that Canadians will be profoundly disappointed. Now, to be sure, there are, appear to be a number of positive measures in this budget, especially those that continue to support Canadians in their time of need as they struggle to make it through to the end of the pandemic. And we will carefully review and analyze them 
to see whether they are sufficient to help our country through this difficult time and to secure our long-term future. So far, I'm not encouraged. But we will have more to say in the days ahead. Until then and until tomorrow, I move that the, the debate be now adjourned. Mr. Fass, seconded by Mr. Dalton, moves that the debate be now adjourned. Conformément à l'article 83.2. Pursuing to Standing Order 83.2, this motion is deemed adopted. This House stands adjourned until tomorrow at 10 a.m.